My name is Osama Salah. I'm a governance and risk management specialist based in the United Arab Emirates. And today I'll be presenting to you a presentation entitled uh, Fast and Furious Quant Risk Analysis Done in 60 Seconds. Now this uh, web conference is a recording, so it is not live. Uh, I won't be able to take your questions, but I believe Alex will be uh, available. He might be able to answer some questions. Other questions will be routed back to me and uh, I'll try to, to respond to them or you can um, contact me directly on uh, the contact addresses you given on the right. So let's get started. Now, um, yeah, this presentation is really for people that are um, unfamiliar with quantitative risk analysis in general, and specifically in cyber security. The objective of this presentation is to demonstrate that anyone can do quantitative risk analysis as quickly as they can do qualitative analysis. And if we invest in, uh, put in a little more effort, we can actually make it uh, very useful. And we will demonstrate this by going uh, through three stages of um, risk management or risk analysis evolution by visiting three different worlds and uh, see how uh, the evolution works or happens. Now in the first world, the scenario is as follows. We have the CEO, he bumps into the CISO in the elevator and uh, has a chat with him and says something like, ah, you're the information security guy, tell me. I keep reading uh, about ransomware and uh, I really don't know. I don't hear anything from the IT people uh, on that topic, but it seems to be everywhere and I'm not sure if I should be worried Will this somehow affect our objectives or plans? Um, I really don't know. So I need some feedback, please. CISO tells him he doesn't believe there is major concern, but he will check with his team and uh, get back uh, with a response by the end of the day. That basically means the CISO goes back, calls a crisis meeting, everyone is assembled, and uh, he tells them of uh, the, the engagement he had with the CEO on the problem they need to get up, uh, get back with a response by the end of the day. So what do they do? They pick out their risk heat map, put it uh, on the screen, and they all start staring at it and wonder, where do we place that dot? They have a constructive discussion, uh, which basically means they start to argue and uh, <laughs> really are not getting anywhere. But usually what happens in these kind of scenarios is two things kick in. You have confirmation bias, where people actually tend um, for the sake of harmony to kind of agree with each other and reach some compromise or middle ground uh, that's one bias usually that kicks in and then we have the authority bias usually they look up to the person with most authority and uh, they see okay is inclined towards what and they go with that um, uh, with the opinion of the person who has most authority so basically that means Nothing to worry about. We have a leader. He will take care of it. We just need to follow the leader. And they have come up with some sort of rational, rationale for their thinking, or maybe it's not rational, it's a rationalization. And anyway, they end up saying something like, okay, we have antivirus software, it's well maintained, no worries haven't had any ransomware attacks in the past. Uh, so that's highly unlikely. And you know what, even worst case, we have backups, we can just restore, uh, no major consequences, consequences are minor. And they place that dot based on these labels and uh, it's green. They are very happy because they followed the approved risk management process in the company. They pat themselves on the back, very proud. 
the risk is low or green. And uh, you know what? They're a very proactive bunch of security specialists. And they say you can never be too sure, but uh, everything is on control. But we will still focus on making sure our antivirus software is always updated and always working. So the message to the CEO is basically keep calm and carry on. Don't worry, we have it all under control. Now, in another universe, far, far away live people that for unexplained reasons prefer numbers over colors and labels. So what do these people do? Same scenario happens, uh, elevator, crisis room, but they don't get out the heat map. They instead have a simple model and that model says risk is really a function of frequency and impact. Pretty much the same we had in the heat map um, with the predefined buckets or squares and they say frequency basically means the likelihood and that's kind of how often could a ransomware attack occur in the next 12 months and cause us harm and the impact is okay if this happens what is the probable impact pretty much the same dimension two dimensions we had uh, in the previous heat map um, and they start thinking uh, in these two uh, variables uh, sorry. And they think, okay, ransomware is just malware. It's like any other malware. So how many incidents did we, for example, have in the past? Maybe that's something we can uh, look at. Uh, are there any industry reports that we could look at uh, that give us maybe an indication of what the trend is? Is ransomware increasing or expected to increase or decrease in the next 12 months? And uh, what is it that we're trying to protect anyway? We have files uh, that uh, they will get encrypted. Workstations will be locked so people will not be able to work. Uh, but we do have backups and we will need to recover them. But until we recover, people will be sitting down idle and not very productive. So that will somehow impact our operation. And they can include or summarize all of that into Maybe we'll have a ransomware incident once in a year, uh, maximum maybe three times per year, but most likely only twice per year. And in terms of impact, yeah, it might take five to eight days to recover, but maybe around six days. And uh, during that time, we're unproductive. If we translate the losses of, of days being unproductive, then translate somehow into uh, around $250,000 loss up to $400,000, but most likely around $300,000. So we pretty much did the same like we did in a heat map. Um, we have buckets uh, or ranges in the heat map. Here we just, in this universe, they defined their own buckets. One bucket goes from one to three, uh, as frequency and another bucket impact is from 250,000 to 400,000. But these people improved a little on their buckets. Uh, first of all, they define their own buckets. So if they make wider buckets, it means uh, there is more uncertainty. If they make the buckets narrower or the range is narrower, it means they're more certain um, um, about their ranges. But they added something else. They also added the most likely uh this is a kind of expressing uh on which side of their spectrum um do they believe uh the, the the loss exposure will most likely happen so for example in the in the frequency it's pretty much in the middle and uh, uh in the impact they believe it's more likely that the impact will be on the lower side than on the higher side so they look at these two dimensions, pretty much like in the heat map. And they say, let's play what if. So what if it happens only once per year? And we have uh, the least impact, but we lose around $250,000. And what if, for example, it happens three times per year and we lose the maximum and it happens, uh, then we lose around $1.2 million. And they play these scenarios, and that was nine scenarios. 
but uh, the people in this universe, they are very good with numbers and they figure, yeah, these are nine scenarios, but there is a, actually a lot of uncertainty. What about all the scenarios in between? What if the consequences will not be 300,000, but will be 352? or it will be $256,000 losses and so on. So there is so much uncertainty and so many other scenarios to think uh, about that are probable and could happen. Uh, why confine ourselves only to these nine scenarios? And they come up with an idea. They look at their ranges and say, okay, these ranges are limiting us. What if we turn these ranges into mathematical functions? into distributions and then we can actually do math on the distributions instead of these ranges. So here we get a nice triangle centered and here we get another triangle um, more on the left side. So they translate their ranges into triangular um, distributions. Now what do they do with these trans um, two distributions, they basically say, okay, we'll play what if again, but we play lots of what ifs. We pick a value from here and randomly, and we pick a value from here randomly and multiply them. We get one what if scenario. And we pick another one randomly and another one randomly, multiply them, we get another what if scenarios. And we keep picking them. But it would be neat if we can pick the ones that are more likely to happen more often than we pick the under others but still not being biased and still to be random. And they come up with another idea, uh, which we will straight on the consequences or the impact distribution. So they look at their impact distribution and say, what if we plot it cumulatively? Um, so for example, if we look here at 95%, this means that um, 95% of uh, all possible uh, scenarios um, will add up to 372,000 um, loss. <coughs> so each, each value here that we get is uh, a cumulative of all the previous values. And you get with this probability distribution. And uh, this probability distribution uh, ends up with probabilities from zero to one. One, of course, because uh, that's where all scenarios uh, are considered. And they look at that and they find out something very neat. Oops, go back. Ah, no, 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 go back. Oh, sorry for that. Okay, and they figure out if we pick up here randomly, let's assume it's just split into uh, this interval and we pick in that interval uh, randomly. Look what happens here. If I pick a value from 86% uh, uh, probability, I get the resulting consequence. If I pick another value randomly, I get another consequence. So that's very neat. What if I do that with values that are closer to where the most likely values happen? We do the same process, but if you look here, the differences between them, they're much narrower than they used to be here. So we pick up here randomly, but we end up with values, more values in the range of the most likely than we end up with values in the, uh, at the ends, the left and, and the right side end of the distribution that are less likely. And this is, uh, they do this, they get lots of values, uh, thousands of values, ten thousands of values, and uh, they're very similar. Uh, now compare that to the nine values we had. They filled up basically all the gaps between these values and they were able to express uh, the values that happen more often, uh, more frequently. And this is what we know as uh, a Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulations have been used since the early 1940s in the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, so, now what do we do with all these values? You have so many values, 
we visualize them graphically. If we visualize them in a histogram, for example, this purple histogram, we'll see many of the loss uh, events are expected, uh, we expected to incur annualized loss exposure of around $600,000. And we also see scenarios uh, that are less likely, around the $300,000. And again, uh, on the high end, very few scenarios that will be in, in, in exceeding 1 million. And we plot again the cumulative probability distribution. And what we can do with that, for example, if we look here on the right side, I map 80%, and that coincides with $759,000, which basically means 80% of the loss events um, that are probable to occur will be equal or below $759,000. Uh, another thing we can look at, for example, uh, if we look here at the 5% and the 95% thresholds, that basically tells us, tells us that 90% of all the loss scenarios um, will be between around $400,000 and $880,000 uh, annualized loss exposure. So that's very neat stuff. Uh, and, and basically, all of that that you're seeing there, uh, now compare that to the single dot we had on the heat map. This is communication. This is an expression of uncertainty. Uh, this is something management can do with, uh, work with. You're talking about uh, dollars and uh, you're expressing your uncertainty. You're not hiding it while nothing uh, like that would ever be expressed with a dot on a heat map. Now let's take the evolution further. Uh, there's another universe far, far away. These people also don't like numbers and colors and labels, but they also don't like mental models. They like formal models. So what does that mean? So basically, uh, we had the heat map before dimensions. We had risk expressed as a frequency and impact, which is a, a simple model. It's a model of uh, two variables, uh, frequency and impact. But what happened when they started discussing this? They basically sat down and said, <coughs> sorry, they started thinking about so many things. Um, what are the threats we're facing? nation state cyber criminals and I don't know what and, and then what do they want from us what is their intention their motivation what are their capabilities they're thinking about vulnerabilities what are the losses that could be uh, occur what impact would it have on availability integrity confidentiality what are our assets primary assets secondary what are our crown jewels uh, what threat types are we facing malicious fraud error what are all the controls that are available and all these technologies that we can use? And what, how do we think about laws, regulations, uh, and all these best practices? How do we put this all together? Where does it fit in this two-dimensional model of uh, frequency and loss magnitude? And they start realizing this is a very simple model uh, um, and that it is not, does not support the thinking process. Now, why do these people like formal models or believe in formal models? Because they have read uh, about the work of uh, many people in this domain, and most famously, I believe, is probably Professor Philip Tetlock. Uh, Professor Tetlock, uh, for about 19 years, he worked with 284 experts, and he started recording uh, their uh, forecasts and uh, started uh, recording how they, good they are and making a forecast and they made in this period around 82,000 forecasts. And he kind of concluded at the end of that research that these experts or forecasters are only slightly more accurate than chance. And usually they're worse than basic extrapolation or algorithms. So we're talking simple algorithms with maybe two variables. Um, so models are, but we are better with models than just depending on our expertise. So he concluded at the end and uh, said uh, it is impossible to find any domain 
in which humans clearly outperformed crude extrapolation algorithms, less still sophisticated, uh, sophisticated statistical ones. So what does that mean for this universe we live in? Sorry. In that universe, they heard about something called the FAIR model, which is available by the FAIR Institute. And that is a model that basically maps out risk. It explains the cause and effect relationship uh, of risk. All the variables that make up risk uh, are documented in this model. And that model is applicable to cybersecurity risk and also to operational risk. So what can we do with this model? It helps us decompose risk. It helps guiding our um, thinking. And the model has very uh, simple uh, definitions uh, or taxonomy. Uh, risk, for example, is simply the probable, uh, uh, the, oops, the probable uh, frequency and probable magnitude of future loss. We had here before frequency, here now it's called loss event frequency. And loss event frequency is simply the probable frequency within a given time frame that losses will materialize from a threat agent's action. Um, so how often will losses be incurred? Usually in a time period of one year. And what makes up loss event frequency? What if I want to break this up into, or decompose it into um, smaller units that I maybe um, can work with, we would decompose it into something called loss event frequency and vulnerability. Threat event frequency is simple, simply uh, the probable frequency within a given time frame that threat agents will act in a manner that may result in loss. So here it may result in loss and here it will incur in lo uh, into loss. And what makes something um, uh, move to move from it might result in loss to actually become a loss event it's the vulnerability and vulnerability uh, is uh, defined as the probability that a threat agent's actions will result in loss now you could break up uh, this again decompose threat event frequency and vulnerability in more parts um, threat event frequencies in, uh, decomposed into contact frequency and probability of action and vulnerability is a function of threat capability and resistance strengths, but we will not go deeper into the model. On the right side, we have the loss magnitude, which is simply the probable magnitude of primary and secondary loss resulting from an event. So loss is categorized or broken up into primary losses and secondary losses. Uh, and also loss in general is split up into um, six loss types. So when we start thinking about loss, uh, we shouldn't only think about productivity like we did in the previous scenarios. There is also replacement cost. There is cost in terms of responding to the event. There might be losses to competitive advantage to our reputation or fines and judgments. And um, we already mentioned there is a category of primary and secondary losses. Uh, and the easiest way maybe to think about it is that pri uh, when you have, for example, 10 event loss events, or let's say five loss events have expected or probably in a year, and you uh, decide um, there will be productivity loss, then you will have productivity loss in each five of them um, in the ranges you define. But secondary losses, for example, uh, reputation losses might not happen in all five events. So uh, it has its own um, frequency of uh, occurrence. And uh, that's basically the easier way, the easiest way I found to think about primary and secondary losses. So what do the people do in this universe? They want to start using the model, but uh, um, before they do that, um, it's critical that we clearly define the risk scenario that will be uh, that we need to analyze. The problem really needs to be um, defined accurately, and uh, the more effort we put into defining the problem, the easier it will be to move forward. 
And in FAIR, we typically do this um, through defining clearly the asset, which is things like production, customer data, order processing, uh, or could be also physical assets. We think about the threat, uh, which could be organized crime, nation states, privileged or uh, normal insiders. And we think about what is the effect to confidentiality, availability, or integrity. As we think about these three, you doc we typically document them in a small table. So here in this scenario, the asset, let's say it's an advertising company, and the asset is the campaign material that they develop for their customers, and these are all stored somewhere on file shares. And the threat, because this is now ransomware, the threat are cyber criminals. And the effect that this will have is uh, on the availability, uh, because they can't access the material anymore. Uh, this will be an availability effect and they can't um, execute their mission. Um, now, you, you could take this scenario further. Uh, you could, for example, um, go further and say, okay, so we have ransomware on our workstations. That means not just the data is encrypted, but the whole ransomware, uh, so the whole workstation usually gets also locked up. So I can't use it, for example, to access my ERP system or CRM system and so on. Uh, but in this scenario, and then typically you would add this as another line, and then at the end aggregate um, all your uh, risks. But let's stick only with one scenario. Let's say they don't have ERM or CRM or whatever, and it's really only shared files. So they go back to the model, and their mission now is to start thinking about each of these building blocks of risk and find out what data sources they have to um, estimate ranges for these. Now, the beauty of this model is that um, if you have um, good estimates that you're comfortable with, that you can support rationally, let's say on the higher level, then there is really no need to go deeper. Um, because if you go deeper and you're even more uncertain about the deeper levels, um, then uh, you're adding more error to your scenario. So let's say if we are able to define loss event frequency, then no need to go and find data for threat event frequency and vulnerability. But if I have a scenario where I don't know anything about loss event frequency, but I have a lot of data on threat event frequency and vulnerability, then I would estimate ranges for these two and derive calculate loss event frequency. So, um, they call in all their subject matter experts and uh, they appoint a focal point who uh, manages this risk uh, scenario analysis discussion and they start thinking about loss event frequency. How often during the next 12 months do we expect to face ransomware events that we lead to losses? Same like uh, we had in the previous universe and then again they could look at data from incident response uh, data, maybe something in their help desk system. Uh, they look at the industry reports, uh, the trends again, is it rising, is it dropping, things like that. And they also thought about, maybe they have some data about threat event frequency. So basically, how often does this help happen in the 12 months? And it might or might not lead to losses. Um, but they kind of conclude in the discussion, they really don't have much data uh, about that. And they also don't have much data about vulnerability. So they really decide, let's stay at this level of loss event frequency. And um, they define loss event frequency uh, as twice to five times per year, most likely three times. <coughs> Now they start thinking about loss magnitude. So what losses will we have? We have multiple uh, loss types. Which of these loss types will be um, relevant for our scenario? And uh, so they look at them, they think about productivity. How will productivity be impacted when there is a ransomware attack? What are the processes that will be impacted? How many staff members will be sitting there idle, unproductively, um, not be able to, uh, to get work done? How will it impact their income 
or revenue? Will there be any replacement costs? Uh, for example, they might have to replace the hard disks and install new ones. Uh, will there be any response costs? So these are costs, for example, they need to hire additional staff to install these hard disks, or they might need uh, some instant response or forensic specialists that might be hired. That would be added to response costs. Um, in terms of competitive advantage, um, will there be any losses incurred? They kind of say, uh, agree, no, in, in their scenario, this doesn't apply. They also don't work in uh, highly regulated uh, industry, so there will be no fines and judgments. But reputation, yes, the reputation will be somehow impacted. And maybe by gaining a bad reputation, they might lose some customers or current customers or future customers. So yes, reputation will have some sort of impact. Now, uh, if we look, for example, at productivity, they get data like uh, average salaries of people and uh, how many uh, days will people, uh, uh, will people be unproductive? And uh, they translate this into uh, a total, uh, cost in terms of being unproductive for people. Um, they look at the response cost, maybe they will have to hire some staff uh, for six, eight or 10 days and what will be the cost of that. Let's not get too hooked up on all these numbers. The important thing is you, you get the idea that you um, look at all the sources you have to get productivity losses at all the sources of data you have to calculate response costs. And now in terms of reputation, yes, they might use some business, so they look at how much more business is forecasted, and they expect to lose 2% to 5% at maximum of future business, and they translate that into, uh, based on their revenue and the profits they make, they expect this will be translated into losses between 300,000 to nine hundred thousand uh, dollars. Now they get these numbers, and what do they do? They use a computational engine or uh, a program, a software program that has this model um, um, plugged in. And you have, for example, the Fair Institute provides the Fair U app available for free. You log in and you plug in the values we have for loss event frequency, the losses we had for primary losses, and when you plug it in there, you get the different categories for each category you plug it in, and you plug in um, the loss event frequency and uh, the loss magnitude, basically this was for the reputation of losses. And all the others you just leave blank uh, because we're not using it. Once you uh, plug in all these numbers and run your analysis, you get a result here, which basically says, says the annualized loss exposure is, is expected to be between 97,000 to $1.8 million. On average, we expect to lose $313,000. Now that also we can plot again in a nice graph, uh, which is called the loss exceedance curve. This is the same loss exceedance curve, but this time in a logarithmic scale, because uh, we can see better. So for example, if we look at 20%, then this tells us that there's a 20% probability that losses will exceed $370,000. And as you can see, that's why it's called a loss exceedance curve. We can also look at uh, non-annualized data. Uh, this is for each event. So for example, here we expect between two and five events per year. Each event uh, that occurs will have uh, at minimum $47,000 uh, loss magnitude uh, at maximum 127 for primary losses. For secondary losses, which was the reputation part, uh, if event occurs, a single event will have between 300 to $864,000 loss. Now the good thing is you can go back uh, and now start thinking about, okay, what do we do uh, in terms of uh, 
remediation. So you think about implementing controls and things like that. And in this company, uh, let's say they use some traditional antivirus and they decided if we upgrade to some next generation antivirus, then we should be able to reduce the loss event frequency. So instead of it being between two to five, maybe we'll reduce it to one and two. You plug in the same numbers, you just change these two numbers in the model and you get new data. Now, before we had annualized loss exposure from 96,000 to 1.8 million, but after treatment, uh, we have it from 48,000 to 990,000 uh, dollars annualized loss exposure. And the average is 300, around 300,000 to 116,000. Now you can use this data to see if the investment into your, into your uh, control, which is in this case, next generation antivirus is justified or not. And you can of course compare again, uh, just by also by looking uh, at the graphs. So to summarize, we started really with a simple heat map, which has uh, lots of colors and labels, and we had to place a dot somewhere. But then we started realizing these buckets that were defined have been defined by someone who has no clue what scenario we're actually working on, and he designed them for to be applicable to all scenarios that we're going to face. And that was in the second uh, universe where they decided, no, that doesn't work for us. We want to define our own buckets. And they came across ranges and probability distributions. Uh, distribution curves to define their own buckets and uh, express, uh, have a better expression of their uncertainty. And in the last model, um, the last universe, sorry, they um, turned to using uh, models to improve uh, on their thinking to replace mental models with formal models. And that's basically how you do quantitative risk analysis very quickly. Now, of course, people uh, might be a little skeptic, um, which is uh, really normal because uh, I believe this whole mess of uh, was heat maps that we're in is because we haven't been critical. Uh, we haven't. We have been kind of indoctrinated into this cult of heat maps. We have been told by experts to use heat maps by best practices, by certifications and books, and we haven't really sought very critically. So it's good to be skeptical and ask questions. One question typically is, are range estimates measurements? We're saying this is quantitative, which means measurements, and we expect really precise numbers. So uh, Bertrand Russell, English mathematician, he said, um, also this may seem a paradox, all exact science is based on the idea of approximation. If a man tells you he knows a thing exactly, then you can be safe in inferring that you are speaking to an exact, inexact man. So exact science is based on idea of approximation. If you think about it, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we acknowledge that for any measurement, um, I could, uh, use a better measurement tool, I could make it more precise, or I could use uh, a better measurement process, uh, which also might give me better um, uh, results. But it doesn't mean that the other tool or the other process was completely useless and wouldn't have been enough. So everything we are using uh, at some point of time is an approximation. And maybe in the future we improve on it and it becomes more accurate and more precise, um, better. So that's kind of, uh, in a summary, the idea uh, that exact science is based on the idea of approximation. That basically means uh, there's nothing wrong with using estimates. Um, Douglas Hubbard, in his books, How to Measure Anything, uh, Finding the Value of Intangibles in Business, and the other book, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risks, also builds on this idea. 
and uh, he defines measurement as a quantitatively expressed reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observations. So these definitions may be slightly different than what uh, we normally think of when we talk about measurements. We expect a single precise number, um, but no, Douglas Hubbard says measurement is a quantitatively, or we need to look at measurement as a quantitatively expressed reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observations. So really, every measurement taken is an estimate uh, with some potential for variance and error. And the question isn't really if uh, a measurement is an estimate or not, because they all are. But what really is important is that these estimates, they need to be accurate. So they need to be correct. They need to reduce our uncertainty. So they need to be able to support our decision making. We need to be able uh, to know more uh, than we have uh, known before the measurement. And we need to be able to arrive at them within our time and resource constraints. Uh, so it shouldn't take forever to make the measurements because then uh, it loses value or it shouldn't be very expensive uh, compared to the decision uh, that needs to be made. So in this context, yes, uh, these range estimates are measurements. Hmm. Another question is, but defining estimates, isn't that just guesswork? Aren't we just making this up? No, we are not guessing. We are estimating. Guessing is intuitive, casual, spontaneous. Uh, no thought really behind it. And estimating is more that something that Mr. Spock would do. Uh, it's an intentional thought process. It's an informed assessment. Uh, we're examining our assumptions. We consider all available data. We develop a rationale and we use ranges to account for our uncertainty. We admit there is uncertainty. We use wider ranges when we are uncertain. We use smaller, uh, narrower ranges when we are more certain. So no, guessing and estimating is uh, not the same or defining uh, these ranges is not guessing, it's estimating. Now, uh, Douglas Hubbard has uh, done some extensive work on that and he gives training workshops on training people on how to make better estimates. And uh, usually when people take training, uh, you get this uh, gray curve. So when people, for example, say they're 70% sure in their estimates, then they're somewhere around 55% really actually only 55% sure. Um, but after the training, when they say they're 70% sure, then they are really are 70% sure, which basically means uh, if we say someone is well calibrated uh, and we say uh, he's 90% confident, then it means when he makes 10 forecasts, nine of these forecasts will be correct. Um, and then that's actually also again proof to show that estimating is not guessing uh, because it doesn't make any sense. You can't get better at guessing uh, through training, but you can get better at estimating through training. And that kind of concludes uh, this uh, session. I hope you liked it. The title was Fast and Furious, Quant Risk Analysis Done in 60 Seconds. So you can do it in 60 seconds, uh, but to do uh, a good quantitative risk analysis, you probably will uh, need more than 60 seconds. But the point here really was to show if you can do qualitative risk analysis in a minute, uh, then you will get useless results. And if all you have is one minute, then I can also do a quantitative risk analysis in one minute but most likely I will also get uh, not very useful results. So it can be done very quickly, but really for better results, yes, you need a little more than 60 seconds. Um, but uh, uh, whatever time, the problems we face, I think they're worth more, uh, investing more than 60 seconds and um, using quantitative risk analysis, you will, uh, will lead to better results than whatever you could be doing with heat maps. Um, if you have any questions, 
here again my contacts. Uh, references that I would recommend if you're interested in the, in the FAIR model. And definitely you need uh, to read the book by uh, Jeff Freund and Jeff Jones, Measuring and Managing Information Risk. Uh, this is an amazing book. Then you have, of course, uh, uh, the, the FAIR model is uh, published uh, by the Open Group. So they have two books called Risk Taxonomy and Risk Analysis. That, so this covers FAIR. If you are interested in uh, cognitive biases, we have really only touched on it on confirmation bias and authority, uh, authority uh, bias. Uh, they have two books by uh, Professor Daniel Kahneman and uh, Richard Taylor that were interesting. If you're interested very in, in general in, in risk management, cybersecurity, or measurement uh, uh, in general, then the books by Douglas Hubbard are interesting uh, in, for uh, the power of forecasting or models, uh, the work of Philip, uh, Professor Philip Tatlock. Uh, another interesting book is uh, by Ber uh, Gerd uh, Gegerenza, uh, Risk Seven. Uh, so once you start reading these books, you will go down the rabbit hole and you will find other books and uh, you will keep on going. Uh, I have also a YouTube video up. Uh, called uh, Certain Reasons Why Heat Maps Must Die, uh, where I explain in detail why we need to give up on heat maps. And um, yeah, check it out. So thank you all, and thanks to Alex for organizing this event. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Bye.